Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by. Welcome to the Ultimate Makeover Interaction ed Edition webinar. During the presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. If you would like to ask a question during the presentation, please use the chat feature located in the lower left corner of your screen. If you need to reach an operator at any time, please press star zero. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded Thursday, March 29, 2012. I would now like to turn the conference over to Daryl Cross, Vice President of Performance Development. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, and thank you for everybody joining us today. We have people from every coast. We have over 170 registrants for this great series on interaction webinars. This one about the ultimate makeover, the interaction edition. My daughter, my 17-year-old daughter, cannot get enough of these kinds of shows that are TV about how we take something that was not quite an ideal state. Maybe we had great intentions for it a long time ago, but over the course of time, maybe a little bit of neglect, maybe some good intentions but mismanaged expectations, they just didn't turn out exactly the way we wanted. We thought we'd brought in uh, some experts from one firm, Shepard Mullen, to talk about how they did their interaction makeover, to not only change the way it looks, but how it operates, what people expect of it, the brand of interaction and what it can do, and how it directly ties into supporting clients, increasing profitability for the firm, and helping us with competitive wins. A lot of the things that many of us talked about with interaction when we first talked about buying it and were reviewing different products. Now, I was the chief marketing officer of a firm in Cleveland, and we bought interaction back in 2003, and we had this great moment when we were discussing with it after the decision had been made to move forward. We were about to start installing it and all the great things it could do, and I did a presentation to all the practice groups and the executive committee, and I remember one person said to me, the head of a real estate practice, you mean this software is going to be able to just instantly look up any contact I want, tell me everything there is to know about them, and I don't have to put anything in? And I looked and I said, no, that's not what it does at all. And they looked at me and goes, well, I'm not quite sure what I'm going to use that for. So from day one, we were having to manage expectations. Who's going to be responsible for doing what? What it was going to be used for? Is it a tool for lawyers or marketing or knowledge management? All those pieces. And so over the course of time with interaction, we have actually seen lots of firms embark on not only technology upgrades, but also use upgrades, rebranding internally, what all this is really for. And that's going to be our discussion today. Because if you think about it, you know, you see these all the time. Any P90X fans out there, you can't do an infomercial at 3 o'clock in the morning without seeing something like this before and after photos of this is how I started and this is how I ended up. Now, in some of those cases, it's just a question of someone sucking their gut in and using better lighting, and we really haven't changed very much. Possibly, maybe the, we did a little bit of just a cleanup before and after to be able to see maybe we just get rid of all the crud on top of things. And maybe this is your data change management efforts. We just want to get everything off the desk or in places where we can find it, get rid of the junk, get rid of the duplicates. But at the end of the day, is it any better? Or have we just cleaned up a system that still doesn't operate exactly the way we had hoped it would on the day we invested in it and possibly invested a lot of time and effort? What we see in some of the makeover shows nowadays is how do we take some existing materials? We don't want to start over. We don't want to get all new things and have to legitimize another purchase of something completely different that might have the same issues, but how we take some base elements, recover them, change them, get rid of some things, bring other things in at relatively low price, and really transform what we're working with. We've seen this on shows like Flip This House and Home Makeover and HGTV, and we just have a lot of experts out there that I think are doing this with systems inside law firms, including interaction and CRM. So that really is going to be the focus today. I'm just mostly going to be the host today and talking about, excuse me for going one slide ahead, we're going to introduce our speakers, talk a little bit about interaction, and of course a conversation with the firm. Think of this like a talk show. 
We're meant to have a conversation back and forth about the best practices, the procedure, the process, but also to help people avoid the landmines that might be stepped on because some of the challenges are very common. The types of people that we're supporting have a theme to them, being risk averse, and also just wanting to spend time with clients. So I'm happy to have with me here today Vicki Spang, who is the Chief Marketing Officer at Shepherd Mullen. And you can see on the screen some of her background and some of her education experience. And also very happy to have with me today Merrill Helms, who is a Knowledge Management Project Manager at Shepherd Mullen. And just incidentally, we're starting to see this kind of collaboration more and more. Not just technology and marketing, but library, knowledge management, office systems, finance, human resources, all part of bringing things together. And just so you wonder who I am, well, my name is Daryl Cross. I used to work inside a law firm, but I've been with Lexis for about eight years now and work with coaching and developing our 1,500-person sales force. So at this point, I want to go ahead and bring in our experts and start talking about a conversation about interaction at Shepherd Mullen. I think many of you might hear some stories that sound familiar, but maybe some approaches that are very, very different. I encourage you to ask questions on the side. Um, I will address those immediately if they require clarification. But some of your questions I might hold till later on in the presentation when we might be planning to address them. I promise to get to as many of your questions as possible before the end, and we will make these materials available for you for review after the presentation. I also will ask you to fill out our survey at the end to see what you thought about today as well as future topics for discussion. So Vicki, Merrill, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. With 117 of your closest friends, right? <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about Shepard Mullen. It would probably be really helpful for people to know about your firm. Some background about both of you as well would be helpful, more than I went into in the beginning. But background in your firm and what the situation was. Can we start there? Sure. I'll start. Uh, I'm Vicki Spang, and I'm the Chief uh, Marketing Officer of Shepherd Mullen, and I've been with the firm eight years. Um, neither my co-presenter Merrill nor I were present when Interaction was first rolled out at Shepherd Mullen, but we know that it was rolled out in the year 2000. And we also know it must not have been rolled out very well <laughs> because um, we lived with the after effects of people being um, either hostile or indifferent to interaction when we stepped in to try to do some upgrades. Uh, Meryl, do you want to talk about your background? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Meryl, and I'm the Knowledge Management Project Manager here at Shepherd. I've been here a little over seven years. Originally, I was hired to come in as a data steward, and I got wrapped up into this uh, upgrade project. And to be honest, I loved it so much that now my um, career has moved on to being a project manager. So it's been a, a long time in the works, but we, we finally made it from um, 4X to our current version of 6.1. Yes, I wanted to – I think our story is one of the tortoise and the hare. Um, in September of 2010, which is not that long ago, as Merrill points out, we were on version 4X. So we're not holding ourselves out as pioneers, needless to say. And next week, we'll be at 6.1.1. So I, I think we're sort of the tortoise and the hare story. We have tried as a firm to stay current in technology, and in fact we were pioneers when it came to blogs. We have about 26 blogs and counting. But the big exception was interaction. And so um, we realized we needed to do an upgrade. Now I know pioneers sometimes end up with a lot of arrows in their wagons. I mean, is it a position of the firm on some of these things that – you are typically not first movers on some of your technology investments, or um, is this more specific to CRM? Um, it was just specific to CRM that we had fallen behind. I think we are um, probably on a par with all major firms ahead of them. Uh, we were pioneers on blogs, but behind them probably on interaction. But we've now made a quantum leap forward, so I'm not sure where we are, how you'd categorize us anymore on interaction. So, so okay. if I asked your, some of your lawyers five years ago to characterize, or even maybe longer than that, five, six, seven years ago, characterize what is interaction for, and they had to write back to me in an email their answer in one sentence, what would they say? I don't know. 
they probably wouldn't want to respond. <laughs> Would that be one of the emails that they delete and go back to work? Yes. Yes, exactly. So it wasn't important enough to warrant a lot of bandwidth and mind share. Was it important yeah. enough? Uh, obviously not. They didn't deem it to be that way since they were um, either turned off to it or ignorant of it. So, so some of the things that you know, what people want to know, of course, are a little bit about some of the questions that went behind things. Um, you know, the original goal, I know that you two were not there at the time it was actually deployed and probably purchased, but you know, have you talked to people about what was the original goal and expectations of you know, installing interaction? Well, I think the, I would assume that the goal is the, the goal we have when we did the upgrade. Um, it, it's a way to manage your contacts. Um, it's a way to, you need to have it. It's a relationship business. And I would give credit to whoever our predecessors were that they knew that and that was their goal going in. Why the execution was uh, rocky, I don't know. And when you did make that decision to upgrade, you know, when did that occur and why? Uh, I, I see on the slide there, you know, the firm growth required technology solutions, but what was behind the decision to go through something as you know, cumbersome and, and time consuming as an upgrade? Well, in a funny way, it was a combination of, it was driven by both a technology need and a business need. Um, you know, Interaction let us know that, that we were so behind that they were no longer going to support us. And the um, beauty of being in that uh, like position was that it created a sense of urgency. And as you know, if, often if you want to get things done, you need to create a sense of urgency. So that enabled us to put it front and center in the spotlight. But then, of course, um, we needed to make not only just a technology case, but a business case for why now, after it had been sort of languishing and had met with a poor reception initially, uh, the obstacles were high for us in terms of our selling it internally and getting the dollars to do the needed upgrade. But we did it. Yeah, in fact, we had some uh, laterals come to our firm, and they were telling us that we, they loved our technology except interaction because it was so old and they were used to using a more current version at their prior firm. So we also had to address those laterals that were coming in. And that as, it was very helpful because um, you know, lawyers are by nature competitive and they don't want to be perceived as falling behind. And when it's coming out of the mouth of a lateral versus someone from knowledge management or marketing, it has more credibility. You know, some of the business situations, I guess, I guess they tie into the overall firm strategy. Can you also just share a little bit, I guess, maybe major changes that occurred with your firm about the same time? Was it growing, going to new markets? Uh, you, know, you mentioned lateral partners, but other major changes that were going on simultaneously that perhaps you either complemented or took advantage of as a timed upgrade? Uh, well, we were growing um, as evidenced by the lateral comment. Also, we were opening new offices. Uh, we've opened a number of new offices in the last few years. Uh, I can't even probably rattle them all off, but uh, Palo Alto, two of them are in China. Um, and so I think that helped the argument. Now, was that something that you tried to take advantage of, as in like, hey, while we're doing this, let's do this too? Or was it something that was going to help drive that change as our ability to expand will be enhanced by interaction? How was that kind of handled? I think we, you know, we cited uh, sort of a keeping up with the Joneses um, approach and, and referenced those laterals. And of course, everyone was aware of our growth plans. But I think our strategy for um, trying to get them to embrace something that was either reviled or uh, they were ignorant of was really accomplished on a in a number of ways. Um, we we gave some thought to who on the executive committee uh, would be an ally or a foe, and um, one of our allies was the marketing partner who is a very uh, active uh, user of interaction, and he's a rainmaker. So we knew. We planted the seed with him that we needed his support, so we kind of greased the skids there. We also were able to find out who our biggest foe was on the executive committee. And the chief knowledge officer at the time, whose name is Rochelle Renegal, she's no longer at Shepard Mullen as she moved to the East Coast and 
we miss her. Uh, she and I uh, came up with a really quick and dirty two-page sheet on why we should upgrade to interaction. And we pulled him aside. We pulled him out of the herd, if you will, and gave him some special tender loving care <clears throat> and met with him and kind of went through, not that we expected him to go from 0 to 10 on the I love interaction scale, but we wanted to move him along the continuum, and I think we did. And I'll share with our listeners if they're interested, not only this document if they want it, but uh, I'll, give, I'll tell you now just what the sort of categories were so you can get the sense of what we did. Again, it's less than two pages. It's just high-level bullets. First, we talked about the history of interaction. We talked about when it was implemented, that it was a rocky rollout. The next item was we gave, them a re we gave him a refresher. And we tried to ask the questions that we thought would be in his mind. So we said, why do we want to do uh, interaction again? And we came up with about 10 bullets. Then we recapped where we are today. We recapped where we want to go from here. We said, why should we even upgrade? Why not just stop and start over? You know, forget interaction. Let's look at alternatives. Um, and we did, in fact, look at alternatives, and we can talk about that later. Um, then we also said, why not maintain the status quo? Because we knew that was something he was thinking. And then lastly, we uh, added, why do we need a consultant, and what services will they provide? And then we ended with the cost. We were very, we didn't shy away from anything. We were just very matter of fact, and we made the strongest case we could, and we succeeded in bringing him along. Again. Not that he went in with pom-poms and said, oh, we have to have interaction. I, I'm not saying that. But we, um, we made a logical argument to him that held sway. Now, is that person, I know you probably won't, don't want to identify exactly who it is, but is this a person in a, for, in a formal technology advising role or just someone with a lot of power and sway at the firm that his, or his opinion counts? Well, I, I guess I would say he was neither in a way. He's very well respected, although he's not a huge rainmaker. Um, he's not on the technology committee. But he just had some sincere and genuine doubts that I think uh, made sense, frankly, given our history. And he just happened to be the most vocal about it. Uh, fortunately for us, he's a reasonable person. And um, you know, he, was, he, was, he gave us an audience, and he did listen. And I think that was helpful so that by the time this came to the committee in, in the form of a budget request, um, we had tamped him down and gotten our allies torqued up a little so that it, it went through. Now, Merrill, you've been doing things with knowledge management in the firm too, and I know there's been a, a big surge in some of the investment in those systems. So similar kind of challenges for systems and processes there, or is this uh, serum was very different uh, compared to some of your knowledge management projects? Well, we were lucky enough to actually have interaction in as a KM tool. It was kind of a uh, KM and uh, business development tool, and we really wanted to use interaction to integrate with our other KM products, such as our um, our portal and our, our intranet, and also with our financial billing systems. But the version we were on at the time just wasn't able to do that at all. So we made the business case that if we were to upgrade, it'd be a lot easier to integrate with our portal and with our uh, financial reporting systems to deliver better value for our attorneys. But entering their contacts actually screws up their lists and there's dupes and, and, or their email freezes or there's some negative consequences, then of course they're gun shy. And then we, and we had the problem that um, you know, we had to, to get them away from thinking not only negatively but thinking positively. And uh, that, was a, that was a tall order. But I, I think they don't always necessarily see the benefit right away or they think it's a marketing thing. Um, it's, it's, it's tough, and we're still evangelizing to this day. Yeah, and I, and I would add to that that there is, there is definite value in interaction, and I think secretaries can see that. It's just the time that it takes to actually grow and really develop the context in interaction to get the value is what attorneys 
don't want to be putting in. But there are some attorneys out there that really do get it. And we did have a few of those champions that were here that understood interaction, understood its value, and were willing to put the time in. So it was either you really liked it or you really didn't. And I think just sh showing people the value of a system like this helped us. Well, I think it's a great point that you know we do see some firms that try to upgrade or manage interaction, its, its view in the firm, just like any other system like document management, finance, whatever. But it is but more personal, wouldn't you agree? Definitely. It, it is when it comes to contacts. Attorneys say, I'm okay seeing everybody else's, but I don't want to share mine. <laughs> That's absolutely right. <laughs> well, let's, let's talk about the decision before we start going into the details of how you did it, because I know that's what everybody's asking for. The investment decision, what did you decide to do? How much to invest time, money, and attention, of course. Uh, not specifics on money, of course. But the, and also, did you look at other options on the way? Did you figure, hey, while we're looking at all of this, would it be a good idea to look at other software platforms or other options? Yes, we did. And we knew that the attorneys would, um, and the executive committee in particular, would expect that we had done so. Because if they thought we were just being lazy or not um, seeing what else is out there since, since, in, since the initial installation, that we wouldn't be doing our jobs and maybe there was a better solution. So we did look at Microsoft's product, CRM for Legal. We did look at um, Constant Contact, and we also looked at Contact Ease. And um, after evaluating those, we stayed with um, Interaction. Well, we, we are happy to hear about that. So let's talk about the process. Because once the decision was made, now we actually have some work to do. And I know a lot of these are probably things that are already moving. It's like hopping on a moving treadmill. How do we maintain access to contacts, um, make it so it's unobtrusive as possible, and intrusive as possible. And then so going through the pre-launch planning, let's talk about that a little bit if, if you don't mind. Um, when you time to get started, what did you do to get started this time as as far as how it differed from the first time that you may have put interaction in at the firm? Well, I think one of the key success factors um, is that both our firm as a whole is really staffed leanly, so no single department could pull this off. Um, and in fact, we, need, we needed uh, the consultants to help us as well. But uh, members from my department, my operations manager, and my events manager, so two people from marketing, as well as anywhere from two to three people from knowledge management, Merrill who's on the call, and the chief knowledge officer at the time, and sometimes a project manager, and then the consultant from Lex LexisNexis. They met weekly for a long, long time, um, you know, trying to figure out how to clean up effectively the old database. We felt we had no room for error in light of the history of this. And so um, I wasn't at those meetings. Meryl can probably shed more light on that, and I'll turn it over to her. But we bonded as a team, and there was incredible cooperation um, between our departments and mutual respect, and I think that helped a lot. And we tried to hammer out and anticipate every single issue um, in advance. Now just to confirm before Meryl chimes in, did you even have a knowledge management department when Interaction was first installed? Uh, no, but we did now uh, at, when, at the time of this upgrade that we're talking about, but we did not back then. Okay, so new players but new assets as well, so that's great. Exactly. Meryl, anything to add there? Sure. The, we really needed to have a really good team. You know, your team is as good as your weakest player, and luckily we really had good people in business development and in KM, and we also had to utilize some IT resources we had to get a uh, database administrator and one of our web engineers from IT. And those weekly meetings, we, we really had to bond. We really had to come together to have this common goal of rolling out a product that our attorneys and secretaries would use. So we, we all really bonded during these weekly meetings. And on the consulting side, we really needed to bring somebody in that had the technical expertise we didn't have a good, solid technical background. There was a database architecture changes that we did not know how to address. 
And secondly, we needed a consultant that had been around the block, that had experience with our ancient 4X version of interaction. And we did shop around for consultants that would fit our team dynamic. And luckily, we found one with uh, LexisNexis Consulting Services. And we, we had her on board as a, on our team, and we had weekly calls with her as well. Now, I actually got a, a question that came in from the audience, and I thought I'd bring it up right now because it just requires a little bit of insight. Um, somebody asked, during pre-launch and then some of these meetings, did you consider bringing in contacts directly from the finance system um, and worry about you know, new contacts appearing in the system that lawyers might not be familiar with? It, was that part of any kind of planning that you did? We actually don't have any contacts in our financial database system. We have the company names for sure, but the people who work at our clients, we didn't have that, so we didn't have to run into that obstacle. But with that said, we did set up application collaboration to bring in the um, financial companies into interaction, and that did present a lot of cleanup for our data steward but we worked with our consultant and they set up um, the rules so we were able to put them all in one folder and address them as need be before we promoted them and let other people see those contacts. So we cleaned up before we, because we did not want to give everybody all, everything in the financial system without mm -hmm. vetting the data. Well, and during some of these team discussions, I know one of the things people have struggles with is deciding what not to do. I mean, is there anything you can share with us that you came to the conclusion we're just not going to do this right now or scale back something we've done in the past? We did have to scale back the scope of what we wanted to do. It would have been nice to have given all the bells and whistles to the attorneys all at once. But because our team was so lean and mean, we really had to limit some of the features. Um, one of those was the uh, Matters and Opportunities module. It would have been great to have had that as an add-on during the rollout, but that's something that we're currently working on now because we, we, we just couldn't give it to our attorneys at that time. Yeah, one thing at a time. Vicki, how about the timeline? Uh, you mentioned that on the slide the timeline of the day that you decided to do this to the day that we announced it to the whole firm that it's, hey, it's been up upgraded. How much time are we talking here? Well, it, it took over well over a year, and then we had the pressure of needing to accelerate because our IT department was rolling out Microsoft 7 Office 2010. So we needed to um, have our ducks in a row by the time they were planning to roll that out. So that meant a lot of um, weekend work and sleepless nights for people like Merrill. <laughs> was that a compatibility issue or just we don't want an overlap of such two big projects? It, it was a definitely a compatibility issue. We learned that the version of interaction we had because we were just so behind was not going to be compatible with Exchange 2010. So that really forced our hand to upgrade interaction. And were there other systems, by the way? I know sometimes firms have got new document management systems and financials, all those kinds of things. Did you have to worry about the concept, I guess, of software fatigue that might be running through the firm a bit? We did, and luckily we have a great project management office here at the firm. So I work closely with those other project managers just to make sure that there was enough buffer between any software upgrades or rollouts to our users that they wouldn't be like, oh, I have another software I have to learn. So it was working with those project managers that helped us. And past the decision process and past what you just mentioned there, I imagine your teams identified some of the key roadblocks that you expect somewhere along the way over the course of this year. Can you share with some of those that you tried to pre-plan for as best you can? Sure. We really, really spent a considerable amount of time with our team and our consultant ahead of time on making sure that the new features we were going to roll out would not interfere, and we wanted to make sure our data was clean. So we were a little bit under-aggressive on our timeline for that, spent a lot of time on rollout plans, how we were going to roll it out to the firm. 
but as much as you can to try to plan for roadblocks, there, there are those potholes that you run into along the way, and we definitely had those towards the end. One well, of the I things like we decided to do was to roll it out um, on an office-by-office -office basis because we thought, you know, if we stub our toe or there's something that we hadn't planned for, we could at least remediate it, you know, locally and it wouldn't be a big brouhaha. And that proved to be a good idea because there were a few little kinks that arose um, that we were able to fix uh, before we went on to the next office. Now, how did you decide the order? Because I know that's a challenge for some firms is people either raise their hand they want to be first or they raise their hand and say we want to be last. We started with the smallest offices and those with the best support. So we, well, we started smallest, I'm talking 15 users in one office. We really wanted to see how our training program was going to work. We trained each secretary in every office. So our pilot was essentially that first office that we had. So once we did that office, we learned, okay, we really can't do that this time, or this is something that we really think we should highlight at our next office. So then we were better prepared once we got to our larger offices. And when we're talking rollout here, what was the ultimate goal of this upgrade? Is it on the desk of every lawyer and their secretary or just, just partners? To, we had a couple questions from the audience about that. Sure. We actually have it on all of our attorneys and secretaries' desks. Everybody had it beforehand and they all have it now. There's no getting away from it. But we really <laughs> wanted to um, to really rebrand and re, re market interaction as something that they could use. I, I know Vicki's going to speak to it later, but when we did marketing, we did the old versus new interaction. Yeah, and some of those small wins along the way during rollout, I mean, what were the things that you were trying to achieve as small wins to know you were heading in the right direction? Uh, I, well, I can actually talk about two personal experiences. So one, we really needed small wins from the secretaries. Secretaries, if they say they don't like it, that means their attorney doesn't like it. So the training, we made it mandatory for all secretaries. And I led a lot of those classes. And I can tell you, almost every secretary that came in gave me a look like this is the last thing that they wanted to do. <laughs> I was going to but, say, that must have been a very popular email day for you. <laughs> oh, it, it was very popular. You must attend something you don't want to do. But at the end of the hour training, secretaries would actually stay longer. They had a lot of great questions. Several secretaries told me that they loved the new interaction and that they were going to go back to their desk and show their attorney how it worked. And this is a total 180 degree change from the faces I saw coming in, and it was great. The second win that we had was something our former CKO experienced when she was demoing for our attorneys. And during her demo, she was in Outlook and she pulled up an email that she received that day from a colleague of hers. And she clicked on who knows whom. And it actually showed the name of a partner that was in the room at the time. And they both looked at each other like, you know John? Oh, I know John. And it really sparked conversation. They both admitted that it was not planned, but it was just like, you know, if you put your contacts in, then we can actually show you this is how it works. So those two wins from secretaries and from partners were, were great for us. And who performed the training? Is it a training department? Was it KM, marketing, combination? It was a combination. We did not have a training department at the time. So training in smaller offices, I had to train the uh, IT representative in that office, and then they went ahead and trained the secretaries. For other offices, I, I trained some of them, all secretaries, mm -hmm. so they all know me well. And we also had our marketing manager and a secretary actually train an entire office. So it was definitely a joint effort between IT business development and knowledge management. Meryl, maybe you can talk about since then now how we have training structured. Sure. So training now, when a secretary comes in, and, and we do have a training department now, secretaries are trained on interaction. It's required. 
It is a part of their training. And when attorneys come into our firm, I believe our marketing managers talk to attorneys about this is, this is interaction and how they can use it to market themselves, add their contacts to events, get their contacts on holiday cards. And, and yes, and so it's, the burden is no longer on KM or marketing alone. We have our official trainers now um, offering this program. Yes. Now, Vicki, I know you really want to brag about this internal marketing campaign because I've seen some <laughs> of it, and it's really good. But as I uh, transition over to that, did you have an executive champion? I know that other people maybe were managing this upgrade and deployment, but was there somebody – a very senior level of the firm that was serving as kind of your executive champion? I would say we had supporters, not champions. Um, it's a subtle distinction. But uh, we made it through with supporters. And one of our supporters who is critical, I believe, is the managing partner. And what you're seeing on the screen now is a still shot from a video that we rolled out. Those are actually two partners in the image you're looking at. The one on the right represents the new interaction, and the one on the left is the old or current interaction. And of course, we are uh, ripping off the Apple commercials of Mac versus PC. And we filmed three videos uh, using a stark white background really mimicking the Apple ads because we thought that would be a fun way to get their attention. And to your point about an executive, we had the managing partner be the first person on the video. He kicked it off in a very straightforward way before we got into the, the skit part. And I'll even read you um, what I wrote for him to say. Um, because. It was all it took, I think, to put the imprimatur of senior management and, and the top dog on this whole effort. And he said, I wanted to participate in this video about the new and improved version of interaction that we'll be rolling out this summer because I think it's important. Ours is still a relationship business. In fact, our most valuable assets are our relationships with clients and contacts. That's why 80% of the AMLA 100 use interaction. I know we are skeptics by nature, and we've had a bumpy history with interaction, but that is exactly what it is, history. With this new version, we'll be taking a giant step forward in terms of functionality and ease of use. I know you'll keep an open mind about the new interaction and be impressed by how much it can help you manage your contacts and much more. And because of its seamless integration with Outlook, you won't even know you're using interaction. It's that easy. And now with apologies to Apple Computer, here is the Shepard Mullen version of old interaction versus new. And I think that sort of said it all because he was trying to get them to keep an open mind. He acknowledged that they're skeptical by nature. He um, tried to get them to be um, you know, positively predisposed. And, and then, of course, by mentioning that a lot of other firms use interaction, that always speaks, you know, they're precedent-driven. and. Uh, it speaks to that need that they have. And so then we kicked off these, these videos that were um, really a lot of fun. At first we thought um, we need to be very specific about you know, all the new features and all the benefits, but then we realized, no, that the main point was just to convey that it's new, that it's better, and that it's easier. And that was what we tried to convey. So what you're seeing in the image there is the first skit called Calming Teas, where um, you know, the, the current interaction is hawking crashing time chamomile, uh, pomegranate patience, and raspberry resolving your contacts. And um, just having fun you know, with the fact that the current interaction we recognized crashed, um, duplicated their contacts, or ran slowly and that it took so long to resolve contacts. And, um, and then the, the cooler guy was the new interaction. One of our three skits also, of course, featured prominently a secretary because there was sort of a tug of, a, almost a physical tug of war over her. You know, which camp would she, would she go with, sticking with something old but that doesn't work, or embracing the new? And again, we had her being caught in the middle between old interaction and new interaction. And she obviously decides that um, she's tired of the pain and frustration of the old one and is going with the new one. So we showed these in a lot of forums. We showed them at partner meetings. We had them on our intranet. And of course, the actors, if you will, were 
our actual attorneys and secretaries, so they saw themselves up there as well. And that was just another, we thought, pretty clever way, fun way to get them to be open-minded about it and to acknowledge that we know where they're coming from. I bet you have these people clamoring for camera time all the time now, don't you? <laughs> we, do have, we do have the benefit of a resident videographer who's quite skilled, so these were you know, fairly professional looking videos. But it, you could hire someone from the outside to do it. Um, it, it really doesn't take all that long. Um, and you know, I wrote the script uh, along with the CKO. And, um, and we were really borrowing liberally from, we, we started looking at the existing Apple ads. So we were um, emulating their style. You know, having to write a 30 second or however long it was spot is actually a very good strategic exercise. I mean, you really got to pick what's important and that kind of translates through to your rollout in general, right? Well, that's right. And that's why I said at first we're thinking, oh, how are we going to talk about all the new bells and whistles? And then we thought we're not. You know, that's boring. Let's just convey, you know, it's new, it's better, it's easier, it's fun, you'll like it, it's a good thing. And, and to introduce a little element of fun and rather than drudgery. Paying, well, right, and everybody's paying you to be insightful, not just informative. They can, they can read. That's right. It, it was more of an attitudinal pitch, if you will, to get them to say, okay, I'll, I'll, give, you, I'll give you an opening here. Now, any other little marketing tech, anything else to share? I mean, was it like a, a formal plan, like you would do anything else, or uh, – uh, was it a little bit haphazard as you saw opportunities? How, how did that work? We didn't really have a formal plan that we documented. We, we knew we wanted to do something jazzy, you know, like these videos at the rollout. And, you know, moving forward, it's been um, more straightforward. We, if you're, if you're on, the, on this call and you're a smaller law firm, one of the things that we did initially was we looked at ex the person who reviewed expense reports, not someone in my department, but the person who reviewed expense reports. If, some, if a, an attorney said that he or she had lunch with Joe Jones of Acme Widgets, she would make sure that Joe Jones of Acme Widgets had been entered in interaction or you would not be reimbursed for your expense. So that little technique, you could imagine, um, was quite successful. Now we're too big for her to be vetting every expense report like that, so she does it on a spot check basis. And also, if we suspect somebody is derelict, we kind of whisper their name to her, and she makes sure to spot check them. So I think that's a fairly good uh, trick. Um, also, obviously, if we're doing events, um, your, your invitee's name has to be an in interaction or we're not inviting them. So that's another way to uh, enforce this. And then we get quarterly reports from KM that let us know um, how many contacts people have in uh, interaction, the number of DCM tickets, and so on, so that we can uh, reach it. When we see a very you know, low number, um, we will proactively, uh, the, the requisite practice group manager who's assigned to that attorney, will reach out to him and or his or her secretary and say, you know, we need to get you on board. What can we do to help you? And make a personal visit if needed to get those numbers up so that by the time the next quarterly report comes out, um, you know, we see that they are indeed using the system. Now, I bet you would recommend, though, that a lot of those tactics require a strong executive champion or supporter so your face doesn't end up on the wall of martyrs in the firm, correct? <laughs> That's right. Um, our executive director, um, you know, is definitely supportive of the um, expense report check idea. And I think, you know, once, you know, a firm has made an investment in a program like this, um, he and others, of course, want it to be used and want it to succeed. So, um, he, you know, we, there's no problem getting support for these measures that I think are just really common sense and not draconian. Now, was all this marketing going on before? For the rollout as it happened after it already had been announced at an office? I just want to get a sense of timing. Well, we knew um, the only thing I've really mentioned that requires some planning are the videos. And, and you know, since we were working hand in glove with KM, we knew exactly when the launch was going to be. So we wanted those videos in the can uh, by then. 
and it really, like I say, it doesn't take that much time, frankly. You just write the script, get the actors, so to speak, and shoot it and, um, and edit it and show it. So um, we had that timetable so that we, because we felt those were essential to have at, at, when we announced. And of course, while all this is going on, there's still a lot of back-end hard work that's going on, right, Meryl? Oh, you bet. Yes, um, we intentionally had the videos sent out first to kind of whet the audience's appetite. When is this happening? When can I access it? While at the same time, we had done the back-end upgrade, but we were doing a lot of cleanup in preparation for actually converting them to the 5.6 version we were upgrading to. Now there's at least five people that have asked the question about that data change management cleanup process. Any kind of tips and strategies of what to tackle first, what's important and what's not? What's most important is really taking care of your top 100 clients. We really don't care about the one-off matter you did that was really small. The top 100 clients need to be as clean as possible. Don't set up your DCM tickets to monitor every activity that goes on. Really set it up for, like I said, the top 100 clients. So you need to prioritize what you want to have the, the users really see, clean data for their top 100, and making sure that the ongoing um, processes, such as the syncing of contacts, happens very, very often, so a secretary says, where are my changes? It will happen as quickly as the sync would allow it to happen instead of a, a one-day sync. Yeah, and I've also heard from a lot of firms that people will go and check the contacts that they can verify, and that includes themselves. So employee data has got to be pretty clean too. Yeah, we definitely lock down our own information. So any changes that happen if someone switches firms, comes here, we really lock that down. So you cannot self-promote yourself in there. We control that. Well, let's talk about in our last uh, 10 minutes here the post-deployment. And then we'll talk about some takeaways. And I do have a few questions from the audience. And I encourage anyone in the audience now to continue to send those in. We'll get to as many as we possibly can. But let's talk about post-deployment because we're not done after the fancy videos are made and the big decision and we roll out the new technology, the CIO is convinced we're not going to crash the Outlook system, all of that. <laughs> User buy-in. We've got to keep doing that every day, right? We sure do. And um, every chance we get, we are proselytizing both the members of KM and my department. Uh, for example, one of my managers is going to fly back to D.C because we've hired a new uh, staff member, and she's going to go back there and uh, train her on interaction and other things. And while she's back there, she's going to take that opportunity to do a sort of a f refresher course for the secretaries in the D.C. office. And I said, hey, if you want to come to New York, do it there too, because um, you just need to keep uh, championing, championing it. And so um, that's, that's what we're doing. And now, of course, we have some um, sort of um, learning requirements for our secretaries now. We have a program where they're required to have a certain number of hours each year of training under their belt. And the beauty is that this can be one of those, um, you know, watching a video about interaction, taking training on interaction can satisfy that requirement. So that's another um, way that we're constantly banging the interaction drum. Now are they using this, mo are most lawyers using it in Outlook? I'm doing more videos. I have to be careful because I don't want them to um, have video fatigue either. You know, a little of that goes a long way because we use videos in a lot of other forums as well. But um, you know, we're moving forward with not only the Matters and Opportunities modules, but also tying into Redwood Analytics and uh, Gwabit, which pulls the email signature information and puts the data in interaction. So those are all on the horizon. And, um, and we also have resuscitated an interaction user group that we're uh, sort of the leaders of and they meet in our office. And that's a way to keep us state-of-the-art and learn from our peers and vice versa. 
Now, Gwabbit is an outside software company that's partnered with Interaction that, that captures the signature block and brings in, I guess, not only new contacts, but helps you update existing contacts, right? Right. Okay. So we're excited that that's on the horizon. So we have, you know, we have a lot, uh, a lot more to to do that I think will only serve to enhance um, in the end user's mind the usefulness of interaction. What's the perception nowadays? I asked you the question earlier. You weren't sure, but if I uh, randomly called, and I promise not to, but if I randomly <laughs> called one of your lawyers at the firm and asked them, "What is interaction, and what do you think about it?" What do you think most of them would say? I think today they would know what it is as opposed to um, several years ago. They would understand what it is, and I think they would um, exceed the value of it, but I'd be lying if I said, you know, we went from zero to ten on, on that scale as well. I don't think they'd be like, it's great, I'm a convert, I now have seen the light. Uh, that's just not true. Um, I think it's a continuum, and we keep pushing uh, everyone in the right direction. Now, is there anything at this point, looking back on it, that even you had a chance to upgrade and do it in your own image, but still, would you have done something differently? I, I know from the project management perspective, I would have not waited so long to have upgraded Interaction. It actually ended up hurting us during the upgrade as we found out that some laterals that came over they had upgraded at their prior firm, and when we converted them to the new version, it duplicated their contacts. So it didn't start them off on the right foot here at the firm. So that's one thing I wish we could have done differently. And any difference in the office order or any of that kind of good stuff out there? Um, you know, the way you deployed it, the way you sold it, or pretty happy with how things went? I think we were pretty happy with way, the way things went based on how our users liked the training, how they started using interaction afterwards. I think all that went pretty smoothly. And a good gauge of that was we went and trained all the offices right before holiday card season. And you have to use interaction to send out holiday cards. So it was really a test of how good we marketed and trained our users. and use interaction, this new interaction, and they really like the new system to send out their holiday cards. And by the way, to address everyone on the phone, because the questions are coming in really fast, it's Gwabbit, G-W-A-B-B-I-T-T, uh, I-T, one T. Um, we'll be happy to send information about that after the fact. Let's talk about takeaways as we go forward. Um, as we come into our last few minutes, any kind of takeaways that you would have um, that you would like to share with other people about technology, project management. You heard a little bit about that, but also lawyer and leadership buy-in. Yes, uh, Meryl and I were talking about that, and we each came up with sort of three major takeaways from our respective vantage points. <clears throat> Mine is sort of the obvious, use your allies and make sure one of them is a managing partner. My second one is peel away and focus on any detractors one-on-one. -on -one. And my third one was to be creative and have some fun with it, as we did with the videos. Meryl? Sure. My, my, three top, my top three takeaways were the first one is definitely good in a, in a departmental relations. You really have to have a really strong team that has a really good dynamic. You're going to be stuck with each other for a long time. Get to know each other. My second is project management and a good project manager team. A project of this magnitude or any interaction upgrade requires a lot of organization, clear communication, and a central location for all information and keeping track of tasks. And my third is know what's going on with other IT projects, as other projects might take time away from your critical resources, and you don't want to get blindsided by another IT project. Now, a couple clarifying questions we have in our last couple minutes. The, the discussion of data change management and cleanup always gets a bunch of people asking questions. So first of all, how many contacts are in your database, and how many data stewards do you have, I guess full-time data stewards, working <laughs> on keeping this clean? Well, like Vicki said earlier, we, we run it lean here. Um, we only have one data steward. She's also Hold on to your hats. We have one. Yes, we've got one and she runs all of Interaction. Our number of contacts 
off the top of my head, I think we have about 800,000. Whoa, they, that's one of the bigger ones I've heard. Good yes. for you. Yes. But so, at the same time, we do farm out some of the work to some secretaries to help the data steward, or else you'd she be having a sleeping bag here, never going home. Yeah, if you decentralize the process, we hear some firms, they do things like have HR take a look at employee records and have uh, someone in a practice group look at the 10 top clients of that practice group. I mean, any of those things to decentralize data change management? Yeah, what we do is we have our, our data steward far, decides to farm out it, the data, and it's usually our top 100 clients or new clients that are coming into the firm. If there's already existing uh, contacts, we really depend on the secretaries to keep that up to date. Hence why it's so important with training. What yeah. is the difference between assistant training, secretary training, versus lawyer training, both, both in scope and I guess amount of time? Well, anytime you say the word training to an attorney, they'll never come to training. So when we did it, say it was free more food of and a, free CLE, right? That's better. yes, yes, that is a lot better grab. So for attorneys, it was more demonstrating the value of what interaction can bring to you. If they were interested, we had a really brief, 15-minute, quick and dirty rundown. For secretaries, we really had to cram it into one hour. It was hard to get them away from their desk. So secretary training was an hour, basic functionality. If they needed more, there are subsequent uh, trainings available. Well, I really appreciate your time today to both Merrill and Vicki. This is a huge project, a moving target, and lots and lots of attorneys involved, their relationships. So I, I do appreciate your time in sharing with us. Thanks for joining us today. Our Thank pleasure. You very much. And just uh, for everybody out there, there's lots of different ways to do this. Your interaction consultants can help you quite a bit. There is a number of resources on the LexisNexis Interaction site that are available for free, and also some more detailed consulting services that can be used. I, I want to close with some information that IBM actually put out several years ago about worldwide CRM. It went across multiple industries, and they found the two success factors or the two factors that either contributed to success or failure, most correlated with success was, does this project have an executive champion or supporter that will put out some of those letters and those videos that we talked about, and how is it positioned at the firm? Top strategic priority or useful but optional? Useful but optional was the, one of the biggest predictors of failure. So take a step back when you're doing your planning and look at those two things and make sure that's covered in your plan as you attempt to do makeovers. Thank you very much for joining. I'm Daryl Cross with LexisNexis. We're happy to take your questions. Please fill out the survey that you will see coming to you about future direction of webinars as well as this one. And I'd like to thank you very much for your time.